It's good to see you this morning. If you would stand, you're already standing. That's great. Hey, I like it. Sing with us as we welcome the Lord into the place today. Oh, Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Oh, Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone our Savior. Show the world your love. Oh, King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can say? Praise Him. And let's just lift our hands together. Let's pray that right now. Would you just ask and invite the Holy Spirit, the King of glory, to come in, to reign over your life, your situations. Maybe you're dealing with some things just absolutely too big for you. They're not too big for God. Nothing is too great for our God. Father, we invite you in to this service we invite you into our hearts and minds and lives individually. Lord, we, we want your presence. And Lord, we invite you to reign in every situation. We invite you to reign in every problem, every victory. As your word says, we reign in life through Jesus Christ. Thank you for lifting us up to be more than conquerors this morning. And we bless you and we honor you. I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the screen. Let's pray for some people we love and some that are friends of ours in the church. But I talked to Sister White yesterday. I don't think she'll mind me saying this. But she's in a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. And I, I want to ask the Lord... And I want to ask you to join your faith with mine, with hers. 
that she's going to get relief. It's been going on for weeks and answers. Would you, would you pray for Sister White today? And also Michael Keating, I don't think he would mind me requesting prayer, is having a heart cath tomorrow. And uh, I want us to pray for Michael that everything's going to be fine. You see the needs as they're listed here. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for one another. And if there's any person here who's sick in their body or they're going through a trial or a difficulty in their life that they need answers for, direction in, whatever the needs may be here today, your Lord, hallelujah, your Lord over our lives, over our problems, over our issues. You who walked on the water, you walk over everything that troubles us today. And you lift us up to live in victory with you. We receive healing, we receive grace, we receive strength right now over this congregation. Lord, I'm thankful that I belong to a body of Christ that believes in the prayer of faith. I'm thankful, Lord, that we can come together and pray to a God who hears and answers, and who longs to touch us and heal us and deliver us and minister your grace in us. And I thank you for that today. And I'm just asking you, Lord, just to manifest your presence and power in every need, every life. Sister White's life, Michael Keating and others, we thank you for that and we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I know there's a lot of ways to praise the Lord. I'd just like to lift my hands. The Bible says lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting in prayer. It teaches us to lift our hands unto the Lord in our praise. It's just a sign of salute to God. It's a sign of complete surrender of ourselves. It's a sign of receiving all of his blessing. Father, we lift our hands in your name to give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. It's so good to see you. Are you glad to see me? Yeah. Smile at you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no. Is, it, is, that, is that vain or what? <laughs> Are you glad to see one another? Turn around and wave at some people. Would you do that? And you may be seated. Hallelujah. It's so good to be in his presence. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. I want to talk with you just a minute, do something a little bit different than the normal order of service that we have. As you know, we are in the second and final week of advancing the vision emphasis that I started last week. And um, I think it's just good for us. And I want to do this more than I ever have to just remind ourselves of the vision that the Lord has given to us as a church. You know, when you see this advancing the vision, it's more than a capital campaign. It's more than programs. It's really the biblical word of the Lord for us to see who he is and what he's doing and what he wants to do in our church, in our lives, and especially our church. And as you look at the slide, by day, your church of God is a multi-generational, and we purposely put that in there because we realize that God gives us a vision to see this church being raised up with young families to pass this baton off that the legacy of this church will continue in Jesus' name and minister to this community. But we're a multi-generational Christian community existing for God's glory. When we talk about the purpose of God in our lives, bottom line, we live for His pleasure. Revelation 4. We live and move and have our being in Him. And we always, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do all for the glory of God. Helping people to know God. 
saving knowledge, a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we had a vision video, and I didn't run that this week. Picture paints a thousand words, and we saw our church in action as we're living out this vision. And as the words of this vision came across the pictorial video that we show, you can see that on our Facebook page and our website. And I encourage you to go, and I appreciate Brandy helping me with that. She would hear my my mind and my heart and she helped me put this together but it's who we are it's who we want to be and if our vision is not scriptural if it's not informed by scripture it's not the vision of the Lord for us and our number one priority is the same as Jesus I came to seek and to save that which was lost we need to be a lighthouse to our family members in this community to help people know Jesus as Savior and Lord. To grow in Christ. I plan to have a growth track that I'm working on even now. As we grow in maturity ourselves through study and the word. But we also grow together in fellowship with one another. Small groups, life groups home groups, ministries that we're a part of, and then we grow out in service because God has given to us his blessing to be a blessing. And then to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, making disciples, to be a going church. You know, we have prayed over our neighbors and these streets surrounding us in prayer walking at least twice and we've reached out to them two or three times inviting them over to be with us through flyers and sometimes we we have a conversation in a few weeks we're going to do another kids crusade vacation bible school and again this year we weren't able to do that last year but in 2019 again this year we're going to canvas our neighbors they've been prayed over we've left them a door hanger saying there's a church around the corner that loves you and that's praying for you I don't know anything that moves the heart of somebody than to know that they were prayed for and we leave them a, a means on that door hanger to contact us with a special email to give us their prayer request and we have been able to make communication and get feedback either personally here or through email. But the point is, we, need, we don't need to be a, a church of come and see. Come and see us. Come and see what we're doing. We must be a church of go and be. That we are the church of the living God. Because bottom line, Matthew 28, 19, is to go therefore. Go. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And um, that's who we are. That's our vision. That's what we want to see our church be and becoming more and more over the next ever how long God grants us here in advancing the vision. A means by which we want to do this is to get our church moving and get our church flowing in some areas that involves ministry expansion as well as aesthetics as well as improvements and I shared those last week we want to complete our sound system about 28,000 that we've started made a, a good uh, progress in we want to uh, have a new marquee a digital LED sign that would be reflective of, of class and excellence here we want to replace the old playground that with with a more modern look that young families coming in can see that we are a church that does have an eye for children and I spent a lot of time here this morning just talking with you but if you'll notice on the pew in, in front of you there is a card 
And uh, I, I left mine back there. Here it is. It just says advancing the vision. And many of you here that was here last week, I thank you for your support and your participation. I thank the Church and Pastors Council for their support and their participation. You know, we would like to see, as you see the next slide, the plan is, is the Lord has blessed our church greatly throughout our history. Now is the time for us to invest in the next generation. The plan is for us to raise $150,000 over the next three years to modernize our ministry, to grow our church younger, and to impact our community for Christ. And on the back, you can fill out your card with your name and what the Lord would have you to do. Now, when you're receiving a free will offering over and beyond the tithe, Moses, when he received the offering for the tabernacle, David, when he received the offering for the temple, Paul, when he received the special offering for the poor saints back in Jerusalem. When, when, he, when these offerings are received, there, there's some criteria. First of all, it's to be a willful offering. It, no one should have somebody deciding for them how they're going to give. Paul said, as each one decides in his heart. Moses said, bring your offering, and David said, bring it willingly. It needs to be a free will offering. No one should ever give over and beyond their tithe, feeling like they're under compulsion. No, it ought to be a free will offering. People who give in a special offering, like what we're inviting you to be a part of, they, they need to give with the motivation of a right heart. Paul said, God loves a, a cheerful giver. Really, it's an hilarious giver. You know, Paul said to the Macedonian churches, or of the Macedonian churches, to the Corinthians, that he was motivating to give in the special offering for the saints at Jerusalem. He said they gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And see, if I don't give with a right heart, God can bless that gift, and he will, but he, he can't bless me with his grace. And I want to be blessed, not just my gift. And, and I want to encourage you, please... And, and, and the third thing, and the final thing about the fifth thing is Paul said, give according to your income. You know, we should never feel like we've got to give beyond what God has provided for us. And this faith commitment is only that. As God provides, you are saying, I'd like to be a part of advancing the vision of the church at Vidalia. You know, you say, well, why do we need to do this? Can I just give? Yes, you can. Bless your heart, you can. But you know, it helps us, me and the, the leadership here, to know what to expect, number one. And then you say, well, I have to sign my name. No, no, you don't. But I hate to tell you this. Now, you would never do this. But there was a church one time that I pastored, and Daryl gets tickled at me, Darren gets tickled at me because he said, Pastor, you only pastored one other one. And I had a teenager that played a prank and, and filled out a card. <laughs> he was going to give some stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and it was a prank. So it just kind of helps us to know what's real and what's not. But I want to thank you for your giving. I want to thank you for blessing your church so generously week in and week out. And as of now, you know, the 150000 that we're raising, as I told you, 78000 is coming from $500 a week that we paid off our mortgage here and we're just putting it aside for our vision. So that only leaves us 72000 And guess what? We've already got over half of that 32000 As of to date, we've got at least 120000 committed or either given for the 150. Can somebody give God praise? Is God a good God? Yes, he is. He's good when we got money and he's good when we don't have so much money. But uh, why do we need to make this investment? Let's look at the purpose and I'm finishing up. Why do we need to make this investment? First, Christ calls us to go, not to stay where we are. Second, this generation needs a vibrant church. Third, the ministry of Christ is to be done with a high standard 
standards of excellence for the glory of God, and then the product. What will we accomplish? First, we will position ourselves to invest more in ministry. Second, we will modernize our campus and enhance our facilities for a fresh new look. Now, let's consecrate. Look at the last slide. Let's consecrate ourselves for a new season of ministry as we give ourselves and our resources to the work of the Lord. Together, we will. Would you just say this with me? If you pray, you're investing in ministry. If you support or you minister in an area, you invest in ministry. If you give, you invest in ministry. I want us to say this together after I say, together we will. Are you ready? Together we will invest in ministry, grow younger, enhance our campus for the glory of God. Amen and amen. Could we just give God praise for who he is and what he's doing in our church? Amen. Amen. Now, if you want to contribute or you want to give, put out a, a, a commitment card, if you would bring it and just put it in this plate as we come to the altar this morning at the close of the service, I would appreciate that. That way we can kind of keep this separate. This is the last Sunday. I'm going to do this in this way. We started it last week and this Sunday. And, um, and, and you see on the screen the ways to give. And if you are tithing and giving, you can drop that in the offering plate as you leave today. We're still not passing the offering plates right now. And uh, that's okay. The people gave in the temple when Jesus was there in a box. And he just watched them as they came by and dropped their gifts in. So having said that, you can give your tithe and your offering other than the advancing division in the back offering plate. But we'd like all the commitment cards and the gifts for this in this plate as you would give today. If you want to pray about it and bring it anytime, it's a three-year commitment. It's a three-year campaign. So we don't have to have everything in today. And I appreciate that and your generosity so very much. So uh, God bless you is my prayer. You know, I'm, I just uh, love visiting with you and taking the time just to talk about our church. We don't do that a lot. We come to worship. We come to encourage each other, to pray for one another, to hear the word of God, to pray together. But it's always good to just be able to visit, talk about what God's doing and the goodness of God in our church. Amen and amen. You know, I'm looking back and I'm seeing two people that are very special to me. And um, some time ago, they moved from the Rinkin area to the Claxton area. And Don and Willa Mayhart, it is so good to see you. Special friends of ours for a long, long time. Thank you for being with us today. And all of our guests... We're just glad that you're here with us today. Let's uh, turn our attention. I think I'm on track. Let's turn our attention to the announcements for the week, and then the praise team is going to come back and lead us in worship. Good morning. We are so glad you decided to join us here at the Church of God. If you're a first-time guest here, we want to connect with you. You can fill out the Connect card in the pew in front of you or scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin you just received. Or you can go to our webpage at valeachurch.org and click Connect at the top right corner. Be sure to stop by the Welcome Center and get your gift. We look forward to seeing you at our next service. A quick reminder immediately following morning worship is afternoon in the gym. For all students, 6th grade through 12th grade, invite a friend to come with you. The competition continues every Wednesday night in Tribe Wars. This competition includes our children's department and our youth, all competing to see who the winner will be. Be here Wednesday night at 6.30. It's breakfast on the menu for Golden Nuggets Tuesday night, June 15th at 6.30 p.m. Meats will be provided. You bring biscuits, fruit, breakfast casserole, sweets. Just plan ahead and come. Be a part of our fellowship. Young adults, this month's fellowship is sure to be interesting. We are going axe throwing. Yes, I said axe throwing in Pooler Friday night, June 25th. See Pastor Brandy for more information. It's time to get ready for the 2020-21 Kids Crusade, July the 11th through the 14th. 
5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Register early online. And for more information, talk to Pastor Brandy. A meeting is scheduled for Sunday, June 27th for those working with Kids Crusade. Please meet Pastor Brandy in the Smith Center immediately following the morning worship. You can stay up to date with all of our church events by following our social media platforms. Now you know some of the happenings here at the Vidalia Church. We invite you to become a part of what God is doing here. Should you need Pastor Merritt or the staff, just give us a call. Our phone numbers are listed in your bulletin. Have a great week and we'll see you at the next service. Jehovah seated on the throne. Abba, Father, the well that overflows, the God who was and is and shall be
a doubt that he has done great things on our behalf. But this morning, are you willing just to praise him just because of who he is today? Because of who you are, I give you glory. Oh, because of who you are. worthy of our praise this morning.
standing, would you just lift your hands one more time and let's take to heed the words of these courses this morning. Let's worship the Lord as the praise team goes to be with you in the congregation as we transition at this time. Let's just give God praise for his presence, his worthiness in our lives for who he is. Oh, Lord, you're great and greatly to be praised. And we lift our hands, we lift our hearts, we lift ourselves in your presence today. Thank you for being with us today, Lord. Can we just give the Lord a praise offering today? <clears throat> amen and amen. And you may be seated. You may be seated. You know, I conclude today just a two-part message is of advancing the vision and the truth of the matter is, uh, God does give us a vision, not only for our church, as I read earlier, but he gives us a vision for our lives, our families, our careers, our education, our marriage, so many areas that we can get a God-given vision for our lives. But we all have to deal with setbacks. There's times you've got to modify the vision. There's times... It's like we say you take two steps forward and one step back. Well, sometimes it's almost like you take two steps forward and three steps back. And we find ourselves set back. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you went after what God had for you with great expectation, great enthusiasm. You had aspirations in your, in your career for your church. And then opposition came. Maybe it was people. Maybe it was adversarial. Maybe it was somebody in your life that you had no control over. Or maybe it was problems and it was difficulties. Maybe financial difficulties. And we can run the gamut, but we know that sometimes when we just go after with aspiration, enthusiasm, expectation, and we make a start to fulfill what God has placed in our heart, for our lives and then that opposition comes and it stops us in our tracks. And when that happens, you know as well as I do, you deal with discouragement. You deal with disillusionment about the whole thing. You, you deal with demoralized feelings because you're not seeing come to pass what you had hoped for. And sometimes we just want to give up on the vision, and we do. We just let it go. I thought about Job, and I'm not preaching from Job, but Job, Job felt that in Job 17 and 11. And he said, my days have passed, my plans are shattered, and so are my desires of my heart. Have you ever just felt that? Just the desire was just sucked out of you to, to do and become the dreams and the goals and the visions that you had for your life and your family. But how many of you read the back of the book about Job? And God blessed him with twice as much. And see, when we're in it, it's hard to see it, just like Job. I mean, he didn't read the back of the book yet. And it's hard for us to grasp, but God wants us to get a hold of his word. How do you really come back from a setback when you started out with dreams and aspirations and you had that setback? How do you find the desire, the strength to get back up and finish what God wanted you to start in the first place? When we find an Old Testament story. It's recorded in the book of Ezra. And it's recorded in the minor prophets of Haggai and Zechariah. And God has a word for some people that felt just that way, was it just in that same predicament, just like we get into with our families, our marriage, our careers, our education, and in our church? And he had a word for the governor, Zerubbabel, who was over the project that the people had envisioned, the rebuilding of the temple. And he said, Zechariah 4 and 6, you know it. Zechariah said this, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And my point is this, many times we're fighting in our own flesh, we're fighting 
in our own willpower, but the Holy Spirit will fill us and he will give us joy and he will give us power and he will give us the desire again. I, I don't know of anything harder than to start back up something that you were doing and it failed. But that's what resurrection life is all about, brothers and sisters. That's, that's what the death of Jesus tells us that Abraham said he calls those things that are not as though they were and he speaks to dead things and they live, hallelujah. And when your dreams have died and, and they're in an ash heap somewhere, if it's a God-given vision for your marriage or your life or whatever area, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit says to you, it's not in your willpower, it's not in your strength, it's not in your wealth, it's not in your ingenuity and your creativity that you can do the will of God anyway and fulfill the vision anyway. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Now the backstory of this great verse is that the Jews, we call this the period, the post-exilic period. This is the time when the Jews had been in captivity for 70 years and they come out of Babylon because Babylon has been conquered by Persia. And the Holy Spirit already inspired Isaiah to say that the king of per uh, Persia, when he comes to reign, a guy named Cyrus, a hundred years before, is the word of God incredible or what? He's going to sign a decree that you can return. And the decree was for a specific purpose. It was not just to come back and rebuild their homeland, which it was. Because the 70 years of their captivity, according to Jeremiah, was to be over, prophesied in advance. But they were to specifically build and rebuild the temple of God. Because 70 to 90 years earlier, the Babylonians had come in, as you remember, and they had completely destroyed the great temple of God, Solomon's temple, where God met with his people. It was a symbol of God's meeting with them in glory and presence. And so when, when they come back, Ezra leads 50,000 of them back to Judah, back to Jerusalem, and they start, man, they are so enthusiastic. They build the altar, the first thing they build. And they started making sacrifices, and the people are just rejoicing. They can sacrifice to the Lord again. And then they laid, in the next two years, they laid the foundation of that temple. And the Bible says they rejoiced again. I mean, they're about to get things back in line with what God had purposed for them. This was God's vision. This was God's purpose. This was God's plan for them. But then opposition came. And the neighboring countries, Samaria and the others, they, they didn't want a strong Judah. They did not want the people of God to rebuild. They knew what that temple meant. They knew what the presence of God in their life meant. And they started attacking the people. And it was attack. It was political attacks. They were doing everything they could. Get letters from the king of Persia trying to stop the building project. And the people got discouraged with fighting. They were going at it in their own strength and their own might and their own power and their own ingenuity. And they forgot about it was the Lord's will, it was the Lord's power, it was the Lord's strength that they were to depend upon. And, and the scripture says that they got very demoralized and discouraged. As a matter of fact, they started building their own houses and uh, started doing their own thing. How many of you know that we always put God first? I'm not talking about just a physical building now, but we always put God first. If we put God first, everything else in our lives falls in places place but they started building their own houses doing their own thing and this is what they said you read it in Haggai <clears throat> chapter 1 they said the time hasn't come for us to build God's house anyway and for the next 16 years all they saw was just that foundation it had weeds growing up around it and they just forgot they just forgot all about it Can you imagine how Zerubbabel felt? He was appointed the governor. Zerubbabel was a descendant of David. He was an ancestor of Jesus according to the flesh. He was really in line to be king, but we know that they're still under Persian domination. And 
this Zerubbabel has been given one task as governor, and that is to oversee the building project. How would you like to be Zerubbabel? He feels like a failure. I, I, I can somehow relate because you feel like, you know, I've lost my confidence. I can't motivate this people. For 16 years, I can see him walking by it every day, going to his office, and, and he has to, he's a reminder of that unfinished work of God, and he had to feel like a failure, and we do sometimes, but I'm so glad that God always finishes what he starts. He finished creation in seven days. Jesus said on that cross, it is finished. Hallelujah. Salvation has come. Jesus always finishes what he starts, and he wants you and I to finish what we start in him. And God raised up two prophets, minor prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. The books are side by side in the Old Testament, near the end of your Old Testament. And they're <clears throat> the two of the three post-exilic prophets, the minor prophets, that came to motivate the people. They're like cheerleaders. And they gave them the word of the Lord. They weren't giving them just a lot of hype. But they were giving them the word of the Lord to get them building again, to get them, give them hope again, to give them joy again. As a matter of fact, they're interesting. Haggai was the older, and Zechariah started prophesy, prophesying the word of the Lord about two months after Haggai started. He was the younger. As a matter of fact, the Bible indicates that he was a very young man when he started prophesying. Haggai was a doer. And Zechariah was a dreamer. Haggai was practical. Zechariah was spiritual. And you see, we need both. We need dreamers and doers. We, we need to put the practical things of God that are spiritual treasures to work in our work-a-day, everyday life. And that's what these two prophets were doing. Just a word here. Let us not compare one another with others. Let's not compete with gifts and callings. We need every gift. We need every calling to work in the body of Christ. Amen? Can I hear an amen? amen. When we start comparing, we start competing. I'm not like them or they're not like somebody else I know. You know, we, we, we're going to focus on Zechariah mostly because Zechariah had eight visions. We don't read about any visions that Haggai specifically had, but Zechariah had eight visions. And this vision in chapter 4 is where we're going this morning. And this vision of the Lord was specifically a word to Zerubbabel, the governor, and the people of God to get going again in their lives. And in these visions, he was saying it's time to build the temple again. It's time to get going. It's time to see what God can do. You know, Zechariah spoke more of Jesus Christ the Messiah, more prophecies than any other minor prophet. Twelve chapters. Haggai's only two. Uh, Zechariah spoke of apocalyptic things. He's with Daniel and, and is fulfilled in the book of Revelation, perhaps more than any other prophet, speaking prophet other than Daniel in the Old Testament concerning apocalyptic events, the second coming again of Jesus, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was used by God to get the people moving again to finish the building. And he said, it's not by might, Zerubbabel. You don't have to feel like a failure. It's not by, uh, by your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, we need to reaffirm again that we're not going to depend on human nature, the flesh, we call it. But we're going to depend on God in this church. We're going to depend on the Holy Spirit in this church. We're going to depend on the Holy Spirit in our personal lives to reinvigorate, to vitalize us for what God's called us to do and what he's called us to be. You know, Joshua, he had big shoes to fill. And he remembered 40 years earlier how that, 
The people had failed to take the land. And here he is. Moses is saying, I'm moving off the scene. Joshua, you're the man. I can't imagine how Joshua must have felt to have to fill the shoes of Moses. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 9 that Moses got Joshua there. He laid his hands on him. And the Bible says that the spirit of wisdom came on Joshua and the people listened to him. David, just a, just a shepherd, just a young boy. No political aspirations in his family. No royal line. But when a Samuel came and anointed him that day to be the next king of Israel, the Bible said when he poured that holy anointing oil on David that the spirit of the... From that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. The prophet Micah, you know, he, he had a, a tall task to, to preach the word of the Lord. Micah 3 and 8, he said, I am filled with power by the spirit of the Lord and justice and, and equity. And he said, I want to declare the word of the Lord by the power and the anointing of God. Jesus Christ himself, our Savior, our Lord and Savior, our great example in the flesh, dependent on the Holy Spirit is an example for every one of us. And if he needed to depend on the Holy Spirit, the very Son of God, how much more do we? And in his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him. And Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 14, says that after that, Jesus went into Galilee in the power of the Spirit and the news spread of him abroad. Those disciples, what ordinary people, what failures they could be at times. And we shouldn't call them failures, but how they could fail at times. But the point is, they learn to depend on God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's not by might or it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit for you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And they learned that. When they, were, when they went under opposition by the Sanhedrin, they said, you can't preach the name of Jesus anymore. The Bible said they got together in a prayer meeting and when they had prayed, Acts 4 and 31, the place where they were assembled was shaken together and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I'm telling you, when you and I depend on the Holy Spirit, what seems to be in, insurmountable to us, we become invincible to Him and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You know, the Apostle Paul, that great persecutor of the church. And I tell you this because he, he, he just wanted to snuff out Christianity. You know his story and in Acts chapter 9, he, God blinds him to give him a vision. And he goes into the city of Damascus and a disciple, kind of a no-name guy, Ananias, we do know his name. He walks up to Paul and he said, I want you to know Paul's got a vision, Ananias. The Lord said to him, he said, he's going to stand before kings and the Gentiles to proclaim my name. And Ananias laid his hands on Paul and said, Brother Paul, receive the Holy Spirit. And you know what Paul said to Agrippa? In the end of his ministry, end of his life, Acts chapter 26, he said, Oh, King Agrippa, that vision was coming to pass. He said, you'll stand before kings and proclaim my name. Paul said, Oh, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but it was the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. You and I need to hear the word of the Lord that says, don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I just, I, I, just before I bring this to, a, to a, a place that we can apply it, you know, this temple, this is more than just a physical structure we're talking about. And the word of God, it was a holy structure. It was where the worship of God took place. As I've already said, it housed the glory of God. And God would meet with his people there in that temple between the cherubim and the holy of holies. But you know, that tem temple was only a symbol. It was only a shadow. Because the true temple, first of all, was Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus, you know, Jesus in John chapter 2, when he got into ministry. The Bible says he walked into the temple of God one day there at Jerusalem and they, they had all kinds of ungodly stuff going on and that can happen in our marriage and in our family and in our churches. And he cleansed that temple. And then he said in John 2 and 19, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise it up, raise it up. And they 
used that against him in a false accusation. You'll remember when they crucified him. He's talking about destroying the temple. No. He said, you destroy this temple. You know, Jesus was the glory of God. John 1 and 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. He is the glory. But second of all, this church is the temple. The Bible tells us in places like 1 Corinthians 3 and 16 that we are the temple of God, that we are the building of God, Acts, um, Ephesians chapter 2. We are a holy temple raised up to bring praises to God as the church. But then you individually, you are the temple of God. Now listen, 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And what he is saying to us is we need to recognize that our bodies are the temple where the Holy Spirit indwells us personally. You know, sometimes we, we think we got to come into a building to feel the glory of God. We need to bring the glory in. We, we are carriers of the glory. Colossians 1 and 27, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look at somebody and say, you're a carrier of the glory. We, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is giving to us a vision for our life to reflect his life, to reflect his glory, to reflect it to our family and at the workplace and in our neighborhood and in our world. Now, in Zechariah 4, and I, I promise you, I'm, I'm bringing this to a, a place we can apply some things here. If you have got, if you are going through that time, you just feel like your aspirations and your dreams have kind of been forgotten. God's not forgotten if they're from him. And sometimes we, we feel like, well, our church may just be another statistic, not so. I won't have it. I won't have it. But it's not by might nor by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Anytime we think we can do something in and of ourselves, it is just in vain. In chapter 4, I told you I was going to wrap it up. There are things. Three rhetorical questions asked to Zerubbabel, to the people of God there. And it's not because God's looking for information. He's asking them those questions so that they can get revelation. Who he is and what he wants to do. And there's three powerful steps that, that I find here as I read these questions that you and I can apply in our lives to get us going again when we feel like that, that we just kind of let the work of God go and the vision and the dreams die. And, and here's the first one. It's in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 2. What do you see? That's the first question the Lord said to Zechariah. This is for the people, but it's coming through Zechariah first. The prophet of God, the one that's going to motivate the people, motivate Zerubbabel to get back to work. To have hope again. To have confidence again. To believe that it's going to happen again. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, what do you see? And, and that's so important. What do you see? What do you see about your life? What do you see that the Lord wants you to do and become? What do you see in your vision for your marriage, in your career, and your church? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl. At the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it. One on the right and one on the uh, right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he's going to tell him. And I'm going to tell you before you would go to the end of the chapter and hear it again as the angel tells him. But how do you see yourself this morning? How do you see the Lord in your life? How do you see his purpose? You know, the priests had the job in that temple, that former temple that has not been rebuilt yet. But they knew that the, there was a, a group of priests that had their sole job was to go in and make sure that that golden lampstand in that holy place, it always had oil. There was an unending supply because the light could never go out. The light could never go out. And the Lord is saying to Zechariah and Zerubbabel, you got to be that light. Zerubbabel, 
You got to see Jesus is the light of the world, John 8 and 12. He's the light of the world. He's the glory of God to us. But then he calls us in Matthew 5 and 16, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Zerubbabel, you are to be that light, and that light is not to go out. And I'm telling you, God doesn't want the light of his life to go out in your marriage, to go out in your career, to go out in your church. Do you believe that? Say amen. Because he's the light of the world. And the all that he sees from these two olive trees represents the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And as that lampstand speaks of Jesus, the light of the world, and it speaks of us, the light of the world, we need to see ourselves as the anointed of the Lord, just like Zerubbabel needed to see himself, just as he was the anointed of the Lord, that it was not by might nor by power, but it's by his Spirit. And the lamp that he saw was that anointing light of light that God wanted to bring in his life. And here's the principle. Here's what if you if you find yourself and your your vision and your aspirations needs to live again, the first thing, this is the message. Stay connected. Those two olive trees were providing an unending supply of oil to those that lampstand with its elaborate channels and pipes going through it to give light to all that would come in its presence. And we need to stay connected to our source, the Lord, the Holy Spirit. We need to stay connected to an unending supply. You know what's interesting is that this oil was provided without human hands. The Old Testament priests had to put human hands involved and get the oil in. And they did their job. But God says, hey, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. I'm going to work in your life in a supernatural way that you can shine for me. The, the bowls, the channels, the seven lights were connected. And you and I need to stay connected to our source. Jesus said, you remember when he gave us the vine and the branches in John 15? He said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. He said, now abide in me. Remain in me. For without me you can't do anything. But if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will. And it shall be done unto you. We need to stay connected. Ephesians 5.18 says be filled with the spirit. It means to be continually filled. And so Zechariah 4 and 6 comes to us this morning. And it says what do you see? Well I need to see myself as the light of the Lord reflecting his light and his love and his glory to a world that needs to see. I need to show it in my family and in my church and in my workaday world every day. This is how the vision is fulfilled. Second question, what are you, O mighty mountain? Well, you know, he calls it a mighty mountain. That kind of scares you there a little bit. Let's you know that, hey, this, this was nothing to play around with. He said, what? That's the second rhetorical question. What are you, O mighty mountain? What was Zerubbabel's mountain? Well, his mountain was opposition, political opposition, opposition from the countries that didn't want them to rebuild that temple, didn't want them to be a strong nation again. The opposition of people that just left the job site and said, hey, we're going to do our own thing. You know, that was his mountain. What's your mountain this morning? What stands in your Godward path to fulfill what he wants you to have in your life, in your home, in your, for your children? Sometimes we have mountains that get in our way. Faith in God moves those mountains. And Jesus said this to us in Matthew 17 and 20. You remember it when he said, have faith in God. And he said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can do what? You can say, everybody say, say. You can say to the mountain, be removed from here to there and not doubt in your heart and it will obey you for nothing is impossible with God. Amen. This is the, the second step from this question is speak faith. And I, and I want to speak very carefully here because what we say has such impact. In our, in, for our, before our children and their lives in our church 
speak faith. We don't only need only to speak to the mountains, but we need to speak blessings over what God has called it. Look at what he said. If, if you were to go back, and you don't have to, Ryan, I'm, I, just, I should have read it earlier. He says, before Zerubbabel, O mountain, you will become level ground. Then he, Zerubbabel, will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Not only you speak to the mountains, but mountains, but you're going to speak to the capstone. Grace, grace, shout it, as a matter of fact, he said. God bless it, God bless it. It's favored, it's favored. And why is that so important? Well, the capstone was the last stone in the building. And all they've got is a foundation. We need to see this. What do you see? And he said, Ze Zechariah tells Zerubbabel, I want you to bring that capstone out. Even though you're just on a foundation, you started with the cornerstone. But I want you to go ahead and see the end from the beginning. And I want you to speak to that capstone and say, God bless it, God bless it, God bless it, God bless it. The project isn't finished yet, but it's as good as finished because it's the will and the word of God. Bring out your future this morning and go ahead and speak to it. Speak blessing and speak favor and speak grace over your children, over your marriage, over your home, over your career that God has led you into, over your church. Don't speak doubt and criticism. It only demoralizes. Speak blessing and speak faith. Amen. Has great implications. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Or the power of life and death are in the tongue. Now verse 7, look at it. Look at verse 7. Because he says, then the word of the Lord came to me. That should be verse 7, not verse 8 and 9 there. I'll get to that in a minute. He said, then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid this foundation of this temple. I love this. The hands of Zerubbabel with the people, they laid the foundation and the hands of Zerubbabel is going to finish it. How many of you believe God finishes what he starts? And that applies to your family. That applies to your life. When you've got a God-given vision, he says, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. I love this. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Amen. So first question, what do you see? Well, you need to see yourself as the anointed of the Lord to give light in darkness, a dark world that people need hope. You need to answer the question, what are you, almighty mountain? You speak faith to that mountain and it shall be removed. You speak God bless it, God bless it over your life, over the vision that God has given. Go ahead and bless that amen. Matter of fact, why don't we just do that right now? Why don't you just lift your hands? I know this is a little awkward. Just lift your hand. I want you to look over your marriage. I want you to look over your home. I want you to look over your children and your grandchildren. I want you to look over what God has given you, even your finances. Yes. I want you to look over your church. Let's say it together. God bless it. God bless it. Amen. Let's say it again. God bless it. God bless it. God bless it. God bless it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Then here comes the third and final question. Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. And then he talks about these seven. These seven lights are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the earth. Listen. Listen. I'm closing, I promise. I'll have you stand in a minute. For sure you'll think I'm closing. All great achievements start small. God always starts small. He says the kingdom of God is the smallest of all seed, that mustard seed. But when it's planted, it becomes a great tree for many to find refuge and hope. You know, sometimes we, uh, you know, uh, we, can't, we can't have what this couple has and we don't have the house and the finance, you know, or we don't have the church. You know, God 
starts small. Here, here's the point. Start where you are and with what you have. And stop looking at what you don't have. That's my point. And that's God's point to Zerubbabel and the rest of the people. Because all great achievements begin that way. And that's the third principle. Start small. Everybody say start small. I know that probably the positive power, positive thinking people that just do motivational sermons every week probably wouldn't like me to say that, but I'm going to say it again. Start small and watch God draw it because it's not by might nor by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. This is great. The people will rejoice, he said, when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now I'm looking at some I'm looking at some people that knows building and and you know what a plumb line is and plumb line you 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 got this this stream you got a weight on the end of it and that gravity it it, it makes it just perfectly straight and when we're building a building a house you know you 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 make sure that the walls are plumb right they're straight because you don't want to to get crooked there. And this is what he said. Hey, the found, just the foundations there. You're going to bring out that capstone. There ain't another stone laying there. You got a lot of stones to, to lay before that capstone. But you're going to go ahead and lay that in from the beginning out there. And say, God bless it. God bless it. And Zerubbabel, I want you to get the plumb line in your hand. And when the plumb line gets it in your hand, the people are going to know you mean business. And they're going to start rejoicing. Because we're going to get back to work for God. We're going to finish what he started. You know, uh, <laughs> people are inspired by what they see in us, our faith, our vision, how much we believe in the vision. It inspires others. And, you know, I, I knew a guy back in Rincon. And I love him, and uh, he, uh, he, he was a man of faith. He had a great business in Rincon, a great business. And it was an exterminating business. And he grew up quite poor. And he, he, he and I would talk. Early in my ministry, he came to the church, and we would talk. And uh, we would talk about his life, and he was so poor growing but he had great aspirations to, to, to do something for his family and make a difference in his community. And he started this exterminating company. And all he started with, he borrowed a Sears and Roebuck old fly sprayer to start with, to start his exterminating business with. And uh, he said, Pastor, he said, I had no beat up pickup. He said one side of the truck looked really nice. The other side was beat up. He said so I would, when I'd pull in front of somebody's house, he said I would go down the street and turn around and put the good side in front of their house. He started small. But he trusted the Lord and, and he was faithful to God. And he had the largest exterminating company in that I would guess maybe other than the national chains in that whole Savannah area. He sold it, went into business, and came back in another area, uh, a county or two over, and started another one and became another great exterminator. I'm not telling you that because you can get out here and say, well, I'm, you know, if I just do this or that, I'm going to be rich. No. I'm just saying start small. And if you put it in the hands of God, God will bless it. Haggai says, and I told you they were contemporaries, Haggai says that when that, uh, God told Zerubbabel to get that plumb line and start that blessing that capstone, then it stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, and it stirred up the spirit of the congregation. But, now you got to advance, and there's going to be opposition, and, and but, you know it. It ain't going to be smooth sailing from there. There were those, Haggai tells us about them. There were those that said, they were weeping as a matter of fact. Said, this little old temple, 
But Solomon's temple, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a big temple. It was so elaborate in this little old thing. <laughs> it won't ever be like it used to be. And you've always got those people that are in their presence and they look, they're looking back at what, they're, what they used to have before opposition hit, before crisis hit, what their marriage used to be, what their finances used to be, what their church used to be, instead of looking ahead to what it can be. And this is what Haggai said. Haggai said, hey, I want to tell you, at this present temple, the glory of this temple is going to be greater than the glory of the former temple. You know why? Because he says the desire of all nations is coming. And some 500 years later, Jesus, the word, and we beheld his glory. He walked into that temple. Who is the temple? Hallelujah to God. And that present temple housed the glory of God. And it was greater than that former temple that was only a type and a shadow of what was to come. And this is what the Lord wanted them to know. This is what he wanted them to to hear that you and I need to look ahead and we need to see the greatness. It may not look right now. It's small. It may not look like a lot, but let's start where we are. Let's start with what we have and let's watch God bless it, give it favor, and grow it. Amen? You know, I was meditating this week. Just, I didn't even know I was going to preach this, to be honest. It's early in the week. I was meditating on the miracles of God. How God works in our life. Miracles. Nothing is impossible to him. And this is what I was reminded of. How many times when God performed a miracle, he would ask, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? Zerubbabel, a bum line. Something that seems pretty insignificant in the big scheme of things. But with that, the people are going to be motivated. And within two years, they built the temple, finished it, completed it. Moses, what's in your hand? Lord, I'm here, I hear you calling me to go back to Egypt, but Lord, Lord, I can't even talk plain. What's in your hand, Moses? Just a shepherd's staff. With that shepherd's staff, he defeated all of Egypt with the power of God and brought water out of the rock. You know, he told Moses to throw it down on the ground. Moses did. It turned into a serpent. And then he said, Moses, pick it up. Pick it up by the tail. And he picked it up and turned it into a staff. And as the black preacher preached, he said, God was teaching Moses, you take care of the little end and I'll take care of the big end. What you got in your hand, David, a sling. But I come to you in the name of the Lord, Goliath, and you will become prey. What do you have in your hand? You know, the widow that was about to see her son sold into slavery, she goes to the prophet, Elisha, and, and she says, help me. Help me. And what does Elisha ask her? What do you have in your house? I don't have anything but just a little bit of oil. <laughs> he said, borrow vessels, quite a few. You start where you are. You start with what you have. You start small. And you watch God. When we put it to use in faith, you watch God begin to work in your home. What do you, we can't feed this multitude, Jesus. Jesus said, what do you got? He just got five loaves and two fish. He said, give them to me. And he blessed it. And he fed the multitude. The only miracle that's recorded by all four Gospels. But you see, God does miracles and he works miracles. But it was always, what do you got in your hand? He uses us to perform the greatest miracles of what we thought was impossible. Stand with me, would you please? Stand with me. 
Here's, here's what I want us to see. I'm closing. All right, let's bring out the capstone. See the end from the beginning. In that vision in your life and say, God bless it. God bless I'm going to go ahead and say it. God bless it. Shout to it. Get the plumb line in your hand. Start with what you have, where you are, because a greater testimony of glory is coming than you and I could ever, ever imagine. You know, God is saying to us this morning, you, you may have failed somewhere along the way, but you're not a failure. Dreams may be in the ash heap, but I'm the God who raises the dead. And if he gives us a vision according to his word, he's going to fulfill it and you can finish it. Go ahead and shout to it. Father, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel his presence. I'm just going to interrupt my prayer right now. It's just before I finish the prayer. If you would, right now, if there's something in your life that's stopping you and that's hindering you, if you've had aspirations and dreams, don't, don't give up on them. If they're from God, if they're... If they're informed by the word of God, as I said to you last week, if they're informed by scripture for the glory of God, I'm telling you, God's not. You might have to modify. It may not, that latter temple may not look like the former temple. That's okay. A greater glory is coming. A greater glory is coming. A greater testimony. A greater testimony. Go ahead and get ready for it in your life. Would you just lift your hands right now before I finish praying and go ahead and begin to receive the work of grace in your life. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Go ahead and start depending on the Holy Spirit. Do that he can do what you can't do. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just lift our hands and we're asking you to move in our marriages this morning. Move in our homes. Move children, Lord, that are so far away from you. God, we believe that our household is going to be saved. We're going to speak over those grandchildren. We're going to speak, God bless it, God bless it, because I got a commandment to bless, amen. I got a commandment to bless and not to curse. Father, we thank you. We, we speak to it this morning. We speak faith to the, those mountains to be removed, and they shall obey. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, give victory in homes this morning. Give victory in hearts and in lives in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead, church. Begin to praise him for your victory. Begin to praise him for the finished work of his grace in your life. We bless you, Lord. We praise you. We honor you for who you are. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. I feel his presence here. Now, I make a commitment to you as your pastor. That it's not by might nor by power, but it's by his spirit. And I make a commitment to you this morning that more than any other time in my life, I'm going to depend on the Holy Spirit to do what he's called me to be and do as your pastor in this church. Father, we need your spirit and thank you that we have you here. We bless you. We praise you. I'm going to ask you to come all around from the building. We're going to close out in prayer. If you're coming to bring your commitment card or your advancing division gift, just put it in the offering plate as you come and just come and gather in this altar. I want us to spend the time that we have left together. The time that we have left together. Would you come? Let's give <clears throat> Let's give ourselves to the work of the Lord. Let's, let's believe that God is speaking to us. He's going to finish what he started in you. David said to the Lord, Psalm 138 and 8, you will fulfill your purpose for me. I trust in you, Lord. Hallelujah. You will complete the work of your hands, Father. Father, as we just come and gather this morning, as we close out this service, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I'm praying, Lord, for people to be saved in our families, in this church, in these altars, Lord. I'm praying, God, for people's lives to be changed and helped and touched. Lord, give new life this morning to careers and marriages and education. 
desires, whatever that might be, Lord, we have faith in you. Thank you for that. We praise you for that. God, help us not to be like the Jews of old. And when we are, help us to hear the word of the Lord this morning for us. That the hands that started it are the hands that finish it. We bless it. We praise you for it. We honor you. If those of you that are watching online or you may be here and you don't know Jesus and you feel like my life has no meaning, yes, it does. The greatest meaning of all, that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The greatest vision you'll ever have is a vision of Jesus Christ in your life, just like John got on the Isle of Patmos. It's not the book of Revelations. It's the book of Revelation. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Him, and He loves you, and He cares about you. and He'll come in your life today and give you hope and a future. I bless you for it. I praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Would you just lay your hand on the shoulder of someone near you? Let's pray for one another. It's so easy, just like Job and Zerubbabel. These were good people. They were good people, but it's so easy to get demoralized. It's so easy. We don't walk around in a high-headed way that that won't ever happen to me. Father, in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. I pray for encouragement and I pray for strength. Hallelujah. In their lives, in their homes, in their hearts. In the name of the Lord. Father, I know it looks like sometimes we'll never see it come to pass. But Lord, our trust is in you. For our children, our spouses, our grandchildren. Our influence. Our influence in this community. As a church. Lord, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. One more time, would you just lift your hands and give God thanks for it all? Hallelujah. God bless it. God bless it. And bless the Lord, oh my soul. Amen. Bless his holy name. Amen. It's so good to be with you. Wednesday nights, we're growing on Wednesday night again after some COVID stuff. But come be with us. We'd love to have you. God bless you is my prayer. And see you Wednesday night. Amen. God bless you. Shake hands and greet ever how you feel comfortable doing that and let people know you love them. By the way, you can pick up a sheet that just reminds you about the vision here as you leave as well. God bless you.